let's see if I can do that. It just popped up live on Facebook on my screen. It did. It did. Well, let's it's see if that saying. works. Did it pop that up on yours, Peter? Well, let's it's see if that saying. works. I think it might be live. Let's see. Let's just check that. Ah, okay. We're live on Facebook. Hey. <laughs> All right. So now uh, I'm going to play some music from my guests that I was playing originally, but then I had technical difficulties, which I'm going to have to face, find out later. Anyway, let's see how we're sounding and everything. Here we go.
Yeah. Ooh. Oh, I really like that. That sounds great. Great playing, you guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, finally, we are okay. <laughs> and uh, we are, my guests today are Terry Seabrook. Uh, he's the pianist and organist, organist that you heard on that. Okay, I sent this one, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and Peter Fray's beautiful sax playing, beautiful tone. You have a great tone. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah. Um, yeah, and um, sorry about the, uh, it's just one of those, uh, you know, technical, <laughs> technical moments. And uh, so we're, <laughs> we're not on, uh, we're not on uh, YouTube. That's, that's what we're not on. But, you know, that's not a big deal. Everything so, works until it doesn't. <laughs> so true, mm -hmm, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So, um, well, first of all, um, First of all, let's see, what do I want to talk about first? Well, first of all, I know that picture on the album cover because <laughs> mm -hmm. I've been to Brighton a whole bunch of times, mm -hmm. Brighton, England, and that's where they are right now, Brighton, England. Yeah. Um, and uh, It's on my shirt, too. Uh, ah. uh, very nice. This very will be nice. the official band uniform. I'm getting, I'm getting nice. the other guys fitted. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess I'd like to know first um, how you guys met, because obviously you're both here. They're both in Brighton right now. And uh, Peter, you're from D.C.? Yep, I'm from Washington, D.C. Um, and that's kind that of where, where you the live story... now? That's where I live now, yeah. Okay. And that's sort of where our story begins, D.C. and Baltimore. Oh. Um, because there is a, uh, a couple um, who are super fans um, of not not me but of like the whole uh jazz scene in the baltimore and dc area uh mike andrews and debbie wilkins and so they for the longest time right up until the pandemic really they would just turn up at almost every gig that you could imagine you know so they're real yeah. fans they're always out there and they came to see uh me quite a bit with um uh, the organist greg hatza who i play with uh in baltimore and uh so i had kind of given Mike a nudge and said, you know, hey, one of these days, you know, see if you can, you know, find maybe a couple of, uh, connect me with somebody over there. Maybe I can do a couple gigs if I come over on vacation, just want to, you know, have something to do. And so he actually um, uh, passed the ball off to Terry. And uh, um, <laughs> yeah, well, he hooked up a couple of gigs. He's involved in the scene here in, in, in various ways. But, you know, he, he made the connection with Terry and Terry hook more things up and so we had a first little uh a little uh, tour together terry brought um jack kendon and milo fell into the fold and uh we had a nice little run of gigs about uh, six years ago now actually oh. and that was the that was the original thing yeah it would, beyond all i you know i just thought oh maybe i can get a little sit in on a gig here or there you know um and instead it was a nice little beginning of something so. yeah so um i'm curious uh terry i didn't really I mean, you know, we've done a gig together, but haven't really talked a lot. So I didn't know that you were traveling to the States. <clears throat> well, I haven't, no, I haven't traveled to the States since I saw you in 2013. Um, okay. I'm hoping to. So the association with Peter has entirely been in the UK. We've had three tours here, 2016, 2018, a big one, 20, I think it was 20, more than 20 dates. And it's just on yeah. the current uh, one this year. Yeah. Of course, we were going to do another one that was knocked out by COVID, so things have been on yeah. hold. But um, uh, it's um, actually at the moment, it's, it's uh, significantly easier for Peter to come to the UK than it is for one or three of us to go to the United States. But we're working on that as a possibility yeah. and uh, try to try do some stateside. So the band's called Atlanticus after all. Um, we want to make we want to make that a bilateral arrangement at some point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's great. So when did you guys make the make decide on having a label? Well, the label is uh, is something that's been going on um, in DC for a while. It's a it's the label oh. that I've been running. It's you know, just sort of like a call it a boutique label, call it a vanity label. But it's a, I've I, we, it started in the mid uh, well early mid nineties um, uh, with uh, and we've got some other records out with some uh, great people on it um, back from back then. We have a record with Sharon Clark. Her first record was on uh, oh. 
people. Uh, but it's a, you know, it's a small little thing just to have. Uh, just yeah, to just have to have. Contemplate. You know, so um, so we uh, we decided to put this one out on there as well. Yeah, Since we already union, had a logo, you know. <laughs> yeah, Union Records. Yeah. So um, I mean, I'm a, I'm a understanding that that's your your own label, is it, Peter, or you share it with other people? Well, yeah, other people have have released uh, records on it. Mostly, it was centered around um, uh, the club called State of the Union in Washington D.C. Oh, These I were see. live live albums. It started off with doing live albums. There, we did a, oh. a live album with my quintet. We did a live album with. Um, a great um, uh, brass and percussion band called A La Carte Brass and Percussion and a hip-hop group, a live hip-hop group called uh, 3LG. They put one out. And then a few studio records along the way uh, with a nice Brazilian band, Origem, and uh, Sharon did her record. And, uh, geez, I put another record out. And then I've just been, whenever I've done a new project, I've, I've put it out on that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a similar label. It's called Debt. No, let's see. What is my label called? Dash Hoffman. <laughs> I don't even know anymore. Yeah. I don't know. It's you, you know yeah. how it is. Being a solo artist, you're, you're just kind of yeah. whatever kind of comes into view and works at the moment, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so we, we we recorded the album uh, back on the last tour, which is 2018, at the end of the tour. Yeah. Did a day in the studio, and so now we're doing this tour to to promote it, and um, it's been going down very well. The band and the CDs have been selling. Much to my surprise, because CDs are yeah. a dying entity, aren't they? But um, we've got the music also, also on streaming yeah. and on Bandcamp. But yeah. people are still out there buying CDs. So Shocking. <laughs> yeah. That's shocking. Yeah, I, I keep my CDs mostly, well, I don't know when the next time I'll go to Japan is, you know, because Japan is just, it's going through a surge and also very tiny spaces to mm -hmm. teach and stuff. So... I haven't. I was supposed to go at the beginning of the pandemic, and then haven't been because I go every year. But um, I keep my CDs to sell in Japan because Japan yeah. is definitely a CD marketplace. You know. Well, I'm God. on live gigs. Sometimes people just they they like the artifact and the souvenir yes. or whatever. Yes. Um, you know, and some people just like to throw their support to the band, and that's a very tangible way yes, to do it. And yes. Yes. Nice, have you guys been in nice, the uh, lovely little lovely little package along the way? You know. Have you guys been in the LP department? Have you been doing that? No. I understand it's worth looking at, but uh, it's just another thing I haven't explored. Yeah. Well, it's expensive, but I have. How about to... you, Kathy? Have you done it? I have not. It's yeah. I. It's a. Uh, I kind of. I don't know why I'm reluctant to do it. I know. I mean, it's expensive for one thing, and I'm. I feel like, am I really going to make my money back? You know, am I going to put out that money? That kind of. It's a little more hefty money, you know. Yeah. Than and CD. it's a whole other mastering process. You have to remaster. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. What about you know, the Otherwise, schlep? it'll sound terrible. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> but I hear people but are selling People records. like, the, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah. Well, cassettes, cassettes are back. And I understand they... that there's also, there's also a market for reel-to-reel. -reel. And it's a, very, it's a very lucrative market because people are, oh. real collectors are out there buying reel-to-reels of albums for 50 quid yeah. upwards. Wow, yeah. like, like sixty, seventy dollars. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> we haven't got to that one yet. Yeah, no, well, no non fungible cause... tokens either. So oh god, <laughs> there's a show on TV now called Anarchists, and they're talking about Bitcoin and yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, leaving the United States for various reasons, and <laughs> it's like, oh my god, my head hurts when I. <laughs> <laughs> and I listen to all of it, but yeah. cassettes. Now that's upsetting because last year I threw out all my cassettes, <laughs> even though I have cassette machines. I just yeah. thought, oh, what am I saving all these for? You know, I have, I can listen to them wherever, and I have a, yeah. a, a bunch on CDs and stuff. But <laughs> oh well. Yeah. Well, um, let's see. So, you know, normally I like to find out about you guys. Uh, your history too. So if you don't mind mm. sitting through a little bit of of uh, each other's history, uh, you may not even know that you're the total history about each other. So uh, Terry, let's start with you. Um, and so uh, you, did you grow up near Brighton or somewhere else in England? I grew up in London. Okay. And I came and I came down to Brighton to go to university to study biology, but after a year switched oh. to music. Oh. Um, and the rest is history. So uh, 
Like I, I also, as part of my studies of music at Sussex University, which is just outside Brighton, I had a, a, a year in the States and I was fortunate enough to spend a year at Eastman School of Music oh. in Rochester. Yeah. I had some, had some great tuition there from Bill Dobbins and Rayburn Wright. Oh, wow. That's pretty cool. That was cool, yeah. Yeah. So then I came back to England, finished off my studies, and um, gradually got into the music business, uh, started teaching, and also trained to become a piano tuner. So that was my bread and butter oh. day job, really, for oh, quite that's... a while. Yeah. But, but now it's, mo it's mostly performing and music, fortunately. Ah, recovering from lockdown, of course, when it all went back to teaching yeah. online again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about the club? So, the club that I ran I hasn't recovered from lockdown. Uh, that oh, really? was the one that you came and played at. You mean the Snowdrop? The Snowdrop yeah. Inn, yeah. Now they, they, they opened, um, but they're only open four days a week, unfortunately. But I'm running something else in that same town, Lewis, at a different venue, which is a slightly different thing, because what we did at the Snowdrop, we had sort of resident band with guest artists each week, and it was free to come in. But we're having uh, entire bands now at the Con Club in Lewis, and Atlanticus played there uh, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, that's they're more like paid events. Is that so uh, I've, I've still got my foot in the promoters camp. Is it a different? Uh, just curious. Is it a different um, environment? Is it a, like a bar, like the Snowdrop, or it's is more it... like a? It's a more. It's a venue. It's, yeah. It's, it's it's not built as a venue, but it's been transformed into a purpose venue. Yeah. Whereas um, a lot of the, a lot of the gigs around, of course, are just uh, just they're very, they're very good. They're basically. Mm -hmm. Free, free to the public in pubs. Yeah. yeah. And the, the pub pays a band a fee and people can walk in and hear them. But this is slightly different. Ah. Yeah. So over the, over the years, I've had different projects. I was very fortunate enough to sort of kickstart my career in performing jazz with the American jazz singer Jolie Wilson, who had residence in Brighton, between Brighton and Paris. And I, I worked for a number of years with him. Uh, we did quite a lot of touring. Um, did some gigs for the State Department, which was very oh. exciting. Went to some exotic places. I'm going to write and, that um, name down. Jody Wilson? Joe, Joe Lee Wilson. He died about six, seven years ago. How do you spell his first yeah. name? So it's Joe, as in Joseph, oh, and then Lee. Joe Lee Wilson. Yeah, I don't, I, I've don't. i never heard of him, but yeah, I'm going to check him out. He's, a, he's, a, he's on YouTube. He's, uh -huh. got, he's a great singer. Great male, male jazz singer. Yeah. Um, and I think he went to a conservatoire in California somewhere at one point. So that's, that's sort of kickstart my career. And I got very interested in Latin music as well. I, I had a, a project band for about 15 years called Cubana Bop. And we did three albums, made three albums and did quite, quite a lot of touring around the UK. Nice. Yeah. Would More you, would you say I... it's definitely, I mean, obviously the name is, has Cuba in it, but is it uh, so leaning towards Cuban music? Very much so, yes. Afro-Cuban grooves, yeah. mambo, cha-cha-cha, rumba, bolero, yeah. one yeah. one those sorts of grooves. Yeah, that was a that was a sextet. And the last thing we did was um, it's quite interesting. We, I decided to do uh, Latin, very Latin-based arrangements of songs from West Side Story. And although the band was instrumental, I got two singers in. Um, Male, male and female singer and we did some touring but then I got approached by the Bernstein estate and was uh, told that I couldn't proceed with the project any longer because they didn't allow people to do covers of West Side Story um, so that wow. was a bit strange so, so I, had to, I had to finish the tour yeah. off uh, but I just changed the name um, yeah that's that, interesting I couldn't, because I couldn't, I couldn't take the project any farther there's that Dave Liebman and Gil Goldstein record called West Side Story Today, I think. Liebman and Gil Goldstein, and I wonder how they got permission to do that. Maybe you can do it as an album, but maybe not as a live performance. Or well, something I think it was a lot easier when yeah. um, when Bernstein himself was alive. Oh, maybe so, yeah, because it that, that he goes He didn't take back. exception, because there were a lot of people that covers. I think Oscar Peterson, yeah, Andre Previn, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Well. Yeah. I'm, I'm always surprised by that. It's like, why wouldn't you want people to... Do your music, you know. Yeah. Well, I think because West Side Story is a show that still tours, and they don't want people taking away from the audience. I suppose that's the way they see it. I mean, I don't think they do. I think yeah. if anything, it would, it would help promote interest in it. But there you go. Yeah, right. that's that's the law, and you can't. Um, mm -hmm. When it comes to publishing and rights, you have to 
follow the rules. That's a shame because you put so much yeah. work into that, obviously, right? Yeah, you'd think there'd be a good tie-in too, you know, to have like that kind of stuff. I think of, I think about the Cannonball uh, Fiddler on the Roof album, Cannonball Adderley record, which was released before the show came out on Broadway. It has tunes that were eventually cut from the Broadway show. But, oh. um, you know, it's a whole yeah. album of arrangements of, of stuff from that. That's just Cannonball and Charles Lloyd and that, that whole band. That's fantastic. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. Intra very interesting, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, um, cool. Let's shift over to Peter and find out a little about Peter's coming up. Peter? Are yeah. You, <laughs> well, so where are you I... From? I am basically uh, from the D.C. area. I, I was there since I was four years old by way of New Jersey. So I grew up in the D.C. suburbs and, uh, you know, went to the public school system there um, uh, after I finished high school. Well, I started getting interested in jazz when I was just rounding the corner into high school, really. Um, I started playing the saxophone when I was nine. So um, that was a lot of the music that was sort of directed my way, you know, that... Uh, um, uh, you know, um, this is what you should listen to as a saxophone player. But I was also very interested in classical music. And in fact, when I went away to conservatory, I went away as a classical major to New England Conservatory. Oh. Uh -huh. um, but I had started um, a, a band with some uh, friends of mine uh, when I was 16 in high school. And we had no idea what we were doing, but we actually had someone uh, oh. manage us. And we did a, quite a nice little circuit of gigs in the Northern Virginia area. And we played it like the Wolf Trap International Children's Festival. And we played it uh, this bar and then we, nice. you know, places like that, you know, um, little venues like that. And so, uh -huh. um, so that, that really put the bug in me, but I was determined to, to actually study classical music because I was an avid, uh, practicer of it and would do all the little solo on ensemble things. So all I ever wanted to do was to go to NEC and it's basically the only school I applied to go to. So I went there and uh, was was pretty quickly uh, disillusioned by that institution. <laughs> it's a great place. <laughs> It's a great place. I mean, I'm not, I'm no shade on NEC, but it just wasn't a good fit for me. I mean, I wanted to sort of study, well, I wanted to study with Joe Allard and I, and I couldn't because I was strictly on the classical side of things. So um, for a school that had that sort of, you know, uh, third stream thing in the middle, it was pretty, pretty hard siloed in some other ways in terms of classical and jazz stuff. And so I just couldn't thread my way through it. You know, other people did, of, of course, quite successfully. Um, so it just didn't end up being a good fit for me. Um, but I made some, you know, some lasting connections there. Um, so I uh, ended up uh, moving over to the Netherlands and, and going to the oh. Royal Conservatory in The Hague. And that's where I was for four years. Oh. Uh, yeah. It's an interesting story how I got there, but we don't have enough time. <laughs> <laughs> but it involved writing the letters and sending cassette tapes and going over without knowing what was going to happen. So anyway, I stayed there for four years <laughs> and uh, was able to kind of study all the different kinds of things that I wanted to um, with a uh, great uh, teacher, Leo van Ostrom, but we had Sal Nistico as a guest teacher for oh, a year. Yeah. And it was just, you know, it was great. And of course, you know, when you go to school in Boston, you know, there's maybe three places to play and there's like 800 saxophone players, you know, between all the different schools and, you know, a thousand guitar players and drummers, it's probably double now. So, you know, it was like, uh, it was just, you know, you could spend all the time in the practice room. So in, in the Netherlands, it was a lot easier to actually go out and, and do some playing and kind of, you know, do that kind of thing. So that was a, a great uh, situation for me. Um, and while I was there, I, I connected with um, the Brazilian drummer, Paulo Prata, who was uh, Paulo Mora's drummer, and he had moved there and was starting a band. So I played in a Brazilian band for three of the four years that I was there um, quite a lot. So that, that kind of connected me with uh, Brazilian music in particular. Um, so that's the, the beginning of that story. But I've, then I've been back in D.C. since the late 80s, since 89. Um, and uh, I've been teaching at the George Washington University. Um, and then uh, since, yeah, since 94. So I've been there a good long time. And oh, kind yeah. of coordinating the jazz studies program there since the late 90s. So, yeah. so that's kind of what was my, my home base gig. And I also teach at, a, at a, like a high school, private school kind of deal now, too. So Do you uh, generally got to keep the lights on. Do you generally stay around D.C. or do you like go to New York? I generally stay around the D.C. area. I've gone on, on various um, 
uh, with different projects uh, on some interesting uh, tours and things. I went, I took my own uh, thing to uh, to Peru at one point with the help mm. of one of my former students, and I've been to Japan with Greg Hatz's group. And there was a rock band that I was in that uh, did quite a bit of, you know, all original music, and we did quite a bit of touring uh, in like the mid '90s to the early 2000s. You know, mostly East Coast, down south a little bit, and out into the Midwest. Um, and I'm still involved with those guys, you know, and various other projects. So keeping yeah. a lot of, you know, keeping my toes in a lot of different kind of styles. Yeah, I just I was just on the East Coast for three weeks. I did a few gigs I did in New York and Boston. And mm -hmm. did, did you ever do the Deerhead Inn in, Del in the Delaware Water Gap? I've never done the Deerhead, no. Do you know about that, Terry, the Deerhead Inn? Uh, I don't know too much. I've heard about it, but no. Keith Jarrett well, recorded a famous recording. Yeah, mm -hmm. did, didn't yeah. yeah. it's really and he interesting. There recently. Yeah, it's really interesting. It's kind of in yeah. the middle of, you know, I mean, it's not nowhere, but it's like out in the boonies, mm -hmm. you know. And people yeah, come yeah. come to that area to hike. It's where Delaware and New York and Pennsylvania meet, and this building is, was built in 1865, mm -hmm. and it's the. Uh, it's been running for about 75 years. It's the oldest continuously running jazz club in America. Mm. And wow. um, very trippy, very chill. People are really cool. And a lot of people have played there. It's a, it's a really interesting place. It's pretty cool. And now, how, what's the capacity of it? Is it a big club? No, it's, it's not really that big. Well. It's, um, I don't know, let's see. Like people sitting down at tables is probably, I don't know, 50, I want to say at the most. And then there's a bar area. So it, the big, the bar is relatively good size, you know, so I don't know, another 30 people at the bar maybe. Yeah, that's about it. Yeah. Very, very nice though. Very, you know, everybody's really cool and, um, yeah, and then you can stay there, which I did, and it's a sort of super old building. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, yeah. you know, I stayed on the fourth floor, my husband and I, and no elevators. And uh, <laughs> so bringing our luggage up and down was interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. But then you just walk downstairs and you, you're set up to play. You know, it's really, it's fun and it's in a nice area. Mm -hmm. um, well, um, let's see. So... I, you know, we could hear some some another piece of music right now. What would you guys like to play? Or something, I can play it from here or whatever. Something from the record, perhaps. Mm -hmm. I just put a link to uh, another track in the chat if you want to play that oh, one. This okay. is uh, Swank, one that we... Uh, yeah, you see, uh, you have a bunch of like Phil Woods, Tom Scott, Joe Henderson. Larry oh, yeah, Hall. and then there's an, the next one underneath there. And what are these other links that you sent me or both of you guys sent me? Like Larry Gold, Pancho Sanchez. Those are just some U YouTube links, I think, of stuff in case we want to just talk about. Uh, that you guys we like. were involved with or no? No. Okay. So it's the, the least, the, the most recent chat uh, thing is. Uh, I see that. It's from me. Yeah, that's, that's, that's from our record.
oh, I'm going to stop there. Um, there's a little more, isn't there? Yeah, just, just a bit more. Yeah. That that's yep. it sounds great though the right the right uh, that's our original right hmm. yeah that's Peter's Peter's done quite a lot of writing on the album and they're really fantastic tunes interesting quite very challenging but um and very energetic so uh, we've been been doing a, a twenty date tour Kathy and we've done eighteen we've got two more to go this week and um, we're now getting ready to do another recording session on Wednesday so we're looking to the next album for yeah. the next tour, which will hopefully be next year. <laughs> Just keep, keep on doing it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that feeling. Yeah. Oh, I wanted to share it with you, Terry, especially you. This is this was my record, um, Straight Ahead to the UK, the one that I did with Andy. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and actually, here's a picture of Brighton from mm. Andy's apartment. And then some of the English band... I, who I'm sure you know some of these guys. Yep, that's Paul Morgan on the left. Uh, the bass player. I can't tell you who the others are. Yeah, it's um. Uh, let's see. It is. Uh, it is. Let's see, Paul Morgan and. Um, come on, where? Oh, Ian Thomas on drums and Simon Gardner on trumpet and uh, that was on piano that one was Roy uh, Hilton uh, John no I think that was John yep. Pierce in the picture but Roy mm -hmm. Hilton was on on a cut and so was Cliff Hall um, yeah so that was fun it was and Norma uh, Norma Winstone was a guest artist on one of the cuts so we yeah. had we had a great time I was really glad actually it was kind of in hock, and um, we did it at Curtis Schwartz's, and um, Andy, rest his soul, didn't finish paying. And so <laughs> I had to get it out of hock, and then I brought it here to L.A., and uh, I had a great producer, arranger, um, and we added a few people. There was a problem with how it was recorded, and um, which was basically not a lot of separation. So you can't tune somebody, right, when somebody else is in the room. <laughs> and so, yeah, so we had to do some finagling. Mm -hmm. and uh, But it ended up with really a cool project. I'll have to send you guys a copy of this one. It's Please pretty do. cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we had the luxury of the pandemic to kind of slowly, you know, uh, chip away at some of the more laborious parts of, of making the record, you know, making selections and... Uh, yeah you know um some composites here and there you know and then the the mixing of it and then we mastered it with uh with uh, a brilliant engineer a guy named greg lukens uh, and the mixing engineer um gant kushner from uh, from dc also just brilliant so it was a great team to work with over there but we were able to bounce stuff back and forth across the ocean um and then we actually did the the mastering session for the record um uh, on Zoom, <laughs> you know, and they would, you know, do it and they'd upload it and we'd listen to it and we'd get, send them back and... We did some you know. of the mixing on Zoom as well. We did a little of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So What's, so what's that... interesting about that is the, um, you know, the the um, speaker setup or, you know, how you're hearing it because it mm -hmm. might be very different. Mine yeah. might be very different than yours. Yeah. So, yeah, that's um, that's interesting. Well, you have to be have people that you can trust, you know, and that's so, yes. you know, uh, yes. and I've had the, the luxury of working with those two before a lot. So when they, uh -huh. when it sounded right coming through my stuff, I was pretty convinced, but you know, balance issues and things like that, you know, were um, good to sort of nip in the bud or, or catch, you know, if I'm too busy listening to the saxophone, you know, <laughs> and yeah, says, well, hey, I have to say it's that too loud, man. Yeah. I, that sounded really very nice. Yeah. But you got, you know, Thank you. the record, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. it sounded really beautiful. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, just, um, so it's kind of spreading out a little bit, a little, little more general type of questions um, of you guys. You know, I, I kind of like to ask people questions about what they think of jazz nowadays or who, who their idols were or... How do you keep going? What inspires you? How do you mm -hmm. practice? That all those kind of questions, you know. Mm -hmm. Having two people, it's a little more 
challenging to ask these questions, but I would like to ask you guys both, um, who were some of your mentors uh, growing up as far as um, whether or not they were teachers of yours or, or people who had passed on, you know, like great artists who you listened to, um, who, who were people who were inspirational to you both? Well, I can just start by saying it was it was my teachers all the way through. Um, yeah. I had great teachers, and when I wasn't didn't I like at, at NEC when I felt it wasn't really the right fit for me, I left and I found a good teacher. You know, I think that's everything. You get um, fixated on the name of the institution sometimes, and what you really need to do is find a good a good fit because there's great teachers and mentors everywhere. So I was lucky to have great uh, uh, instrumental music teachers in my you know, in all of my schooling from the moment that I started till the moment I graduated, and then I was able to forge my own path. What so about that's the number one thing, you know? Yeah, what about people you listened to uh, some of the greater, you know, artists of, of our Yeah, well, um, for me, I'll, I'll just keep going here for a second. I mean, I came of age sort of musically in the in the latter part of the 70s um, and into the 80s, meaning it's that's when I started to really make like critical decisions about what I really liked. Um, but I was into really um, hard rock music, um, and I, I still am. I still I still enjoy it very much. Um, and uh, but at the same time, I was listening to those great Shaka Khan records of like 1980 and and just before the ones with the bebop medleys, the Arif Martin productions were just unbelievable to me. And uh, I got into Joni Mitchell. A lot of it had to do with the fact that I I became a Michael Brecker fanatic. I mean, that was like the guy. If you play the saxophone, um, especially in that era that was the guy and he was for so long you know in terms of like you couldn't sort of uh, get away <laughs> from just how incredible it was you know and all of the different things uh, uh, that he did so that 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 was a huge i have to interrupt you have you read the book on his i haven't read it yet no i know it's out but uh, yeah, I'm, yeah. i haven't read it yet yeah uh, but it's about time that that that, that something like that came out yeah definitely so, but you know i mean it, he wasn't he wasn't my first saxophone love the first thing i i really got into uh, that was like sort of music like that, that was, uh, you know, jazz or jazz. Jason was Tom Scott and the LA Express. Oh, sure. Yeah. Those first two records just knocked me out. I love them, you know. <laughs> um, great with, you know, with Joe Sample and Larry Carlton on the first one and Robin Ford on the second one and Max Bennett and John Gurren on both of them. Those were just like, the groove is so incredible. Um, and it's very accessible, you know. And of course, they were Joni Mitchell's backing band. Um and, uh, and then late, later on, um, I, I found out about the, the the Shadows and Light Joni Mitchell backing band, which was Mike Brecker, Pat Metheny, Jocko and Don Elias and Lyle Mays, yeah, because was it was crazy. being used as the videotape to demonstrate a beta video machine at the, at the mall. <laughs> I walked past it and was like, what? What's that? And it was it was it was that. So, you know, so so Joni Mitchell was a big, big connection of that to me. And of course, I'm still a Joni Mitchell fanatic to this day too. Um, so I like um, all different kinds of things. So, but those are, those are threads that led me, you know, once I started like just trying to find records that had Michael Brecker on it, I got to yeah. Chick Corea, I got to all different kinds of things. You know, the, I first heard him on a heavy metal record, actually a Blue Oyster Cult album. Oh, really? That's where I first like actually read his name in print. And then I went to the record store and found the record called Heavy Metal Bebop. And that was it, you know, so that was, that was the, that was the, one of the big threads, you know, and so, so I tell that to my students all the time that, you know, pay attention to like everybody who's making the music on what you like, whether it's these days, the producer or the guest rapper, or whether it's the guitar solo or whatever, find out who they are and then and, and follow them, you know, follow all those tendrils out and you'll find so much music because, you know, someone who plays a great guitar solo on a pop record, you know, if you like that. You know, chances are they're a session person who's played on all kinds of stuff and maybe has their own band and blah, 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 you know. And so I think that that's a really, a really good thread, you know, and just pay attention to all the stuff. You know, we don't get that when we stream these days. So you don't have that kind of immediate kind of delving into the data of what's going on. You know, for example, that first Tom Scott record, there's a John Coltrane tune to Homie Dance. Maybe the first time I really became aware of John Coltrane as somebody uh, who was in the music somehow, you know what I mean? And then, you know, cause I got into that when I was quite young, actually. So, That's interesting. you know, I'm not, yeah. I'm not really aware of heavy metal bebop. What, what, what is that? That's the, that's the Brecker brothers, Mike and Randy Brecker. It's a fusion record, you know, um, which is just, you know, it's on 11 the whole time. It's, it's, but it's, 
you know, these incredible sort of very modern jazz vocabulary solos over these just rock and, and funk kind of beats and, and incredible writing by Randy. That He's a very inspirational person for me. You know, he writes in sort of multiphonic ways. He writes in sort of two keys at once and things like that. Um, and just, the, you know, the stuff, you know, and plus just technically outstanding. So it might be a bit much for some people, but, you know, and of course the Brecker brothers, you know, from sort of, sugary pop stuff on some of their records when they were trying to get hits to like the more just like you know uh you know intellectual fusiony stuff in the in the latter days and i mean it's just all it's all great so yeah that that's... was that was that was one of my big inspirations but just you know that led me back to that that's what led me back to john coltrane you know you find out who about them who who they are what about them who their influences are and you want to go listen so yeah you know. yeah well look how ma look how many people are doing monk in the last 20 years mm. you know? tons and tons of people all kinds of treatments mm -hmm. yeah but uh yeah that's that's a very cool uh direction to steer students into and you know people who are interested um and i know i know a lot of people like that like who are studio players who've played on all kinds of stuff mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff i mean one of my favorite guitar players is bill frizzell he's mm -hmm. he's played a lot on a lot of different things oh yeah yeah he was well, just over here too oh yeah he was here too he was mm -hmm. played with his trio at this really interesting room kind of a stand-up you know mostly standing room you know with a sh very mm -hmm. short stage and it was packed as wow, and it yeah, was packed with young people too which i i was very happy about you know to see he was playing at love supreme recently wasn't he he was with he was with charles lloyd yeah. He's with Charles Lloyd at Love Supreme, yeah. Yeah. Love Supreme is a jazz festival in the UK, uh, the biggest one in Europe, I think, now. And uh, we played there recently as part of our tour. It's uh, near Lewis, actually. It's a big festival, and they get American guests and European guests, as well as a lot of local bands as well. Cool. Wow. That's nice. I never heard of that, that festival. Okay, Terry, your turn. My turn. Well, um, I guess... Uh, my first big teacher was Bill Dobbins at uh, Eastman School of Music, yeah, and I learned yeah. a lot from Bill. And then when I came back to the UK, I didn't really have uh, much jazz education because it was a classical music course. So from then on, I was largely self-taught, I would say, although I had odd, odd lessons and bought a lot of theory books. Um, uh, so I think I've had my inspiration as well from a lot of other musicians I've worked with and put projects together with. And um, I've, I've, I've had quite a few projects over the years. and. I've been a band leader, so um, it's given me the opportunity to write for those bands and learn how to write. It's been a slow, slow and long process, but I do enjoy writing, and particularly for the projects. And um, certainly Kubana Bot, which is the Latin band, was um, a very vibey band with a group, group of musicians who were very keen to play that style of music. Um, we had quite a lot of people interested in getting into the African percussion in Brighton at that time. I don't know why, but it was... There's quite a, you know, a lot of resources in terms of musicians mm. to work with. So um, that that was great. And I, I sort of fell in love with Latin music as well. As Poncho Sanchez's band in America was one band that uh, I collected records of, um, along with Eddie Palmieri's band in New York. Um, uh, later on, I got into playing the organ. It's, it's, uh, it's a more recent thing, and this is what's featured on this current album, uh, it's, it's, it's all organ and i came to the states in 2013 when i met you again kathy and um i hooked up with larry goldings for some for a lesson and uh because he became one of my big uh heroes so um larry larry was great he uh he, he corrected a few things i wasn't quite doing right on the organ so i was very grateful for that and i've seen, seen him here in his band play three times i think once at Ronnie Scott's and uh, twice at, in other venues. That's great. Uh, it, it's great in, in, terms of the, in terms of the piano players, um, I mean, you know, I like, I suppose one of my first big, big loves was obviously Bill Evans, Bud Powell, Thelonious Monk, um, Robbie Hancock, Chick Corea. And in fact, I saw, I saw Chick Corea when I was in Los Angeles in 2013. 
at one of the clubs and that was absolutely wonderful and he, he finished off the gig by getting Herbie Hancock up to play who we didn't realize was in the audience so that was a real double treat to see the two of them play together on one piano <laughs> <laughs> that's great yeah are you and, familiar uh, with uh, Jane Bennett sorry are you familiar with Jane, Jane Bennett. Bennett no Wait, she's a lot of Cuban. Yeah. yeah, Peter, you have to turn him on to her. Is yeah, she, uh... <clears throat> saxophonist, but um, mostly soprano player, I guess. And um, but she has she's got a lot of really great um, uh, Afro-Cuban projects. Yeah. yeah, she has one particular mm -hmm. one that I saw a few months ago here, um, yeah. a a women's Cuban band and mm -hmm. uh, all mother, mother, you know what? Um, mm -hmm players really everybody's really good and uh, the singer was a canadian singer that they've hooked up with recently and she was she was mind-blowing um mm. yeah so but it's really it's they're all cuban women and really great players wow yeah i bet that's great yeah it really is so yeah, yeah right. and so um and you know i mean i'm sure you've heard larry play piano too larry goldings I've got I've got one of his records. He's playing piano. Yeah, he's really a great pianist as well. Fantastic. Yeah, he's he's so quirky, <laughs> you know. And the, like he plays that little. I don't know if you've seen him more recently, but he has this little strange little electric instrument that he plays. That's like I don't know what the hell it is. It's a very strange. It's a strange keyboard, and he, he it's really electronic. Yeah, it's electric yeah. and. Yeah, you should you should check it out. It's kind of it's strange. He's he's just he's such an interesting guy. And how about his uh, his funny his co comedian stuff? Uh, what is that? The uh, Hans Groener. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Hans Groener. Oh my yeah. god. Yes, yeah, very funny. <laughs> <laughs> very really, tongue in cheek. Yeah. Very tongue in cheek. I actually have another persona that I used to do with a friend of mine. Somehow. It came up. I was uh, booking a series here, a jazz series, and at whatever for whatever reason, my girlfriend and I started clowning around, and we were like these uh, kind of New York Jewish girls, you know. And we were, and so we had this whole line called Misty and Cassie. It's on YouTube and stuff, but <laughs> it's pretty funny, you know. I mean. Uh -huh. You don't think about it because it's really creative and it's in the minute, it, you know, it's in the moment and stuff. So and then then you have to decide if you want to make it public. But it was funny. So <laughs> we made it public. <laughs> but yeah. um, the Hans Groiner thing is so perfect. Oh, God. Oh, Frank Griffith is here. He says hi. Hey, wonderful. Hey, hi to Frank. <laughs> you probably don't know Frank, do you, Peter? I don't know. No, he's an hi, American saxophone and clarinet player oh, uh, frank who lives in who liverpool came out, lives in liverpool but he was in london oh, okay. and i used i used to oh, teach yeah. with him at uh -huh. the richmond adult college oh nice yeah and he has a radio show cool and he's a great arranger and writer too nice and he's been on this show <laughs> has he yes you can see that you can see him in the archives great so we have all that in common that's fantastic <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah. <laughs> well, so yeah, music is, uh, it's interesting right now. What, um, do you think right now that music is reflecting um, more of a blending than it did before? Like, like Peter, you were talking about the, you know, how the year is coming up with the Breckers and all that mm -hmm. stuff. Do you think now it's, it's actually blending with other, other genres more, even more so? Well, that's very, um, just from my perspective coming over here, um, yeah. it's very, very much happening uh, so in the UK with these uh -huh. young uh, groups, you know. Um, it's really, I think it's very exciting. So there's a lot of like electronica, DJ, you know, uh, hip hop stuff and a lot of world music coming in. Of course, that has, that's not brand new. I mean, there's, yeah. uh, I have a, a, like an early 1990s Michael Urbaniak album that's like very hip hop right. influenced too, you know what I mean? So it's like, yeah, it's, yeah. it's always been sort of this sort of, you know, once, you know, once jazz becomes sort of the world music that it kind of is now, you know, all over the world um, yeah. and just absorbing all these things, absorbing, you know, the, the 
trying to absorb like the Indian influences in the sixties and all that kind of stuff and the early Latin stuff. And I mean, it's just, it, it, it is kind of like always been like that. Um, and I think that there was a period that we had where it was kind of very reactionary where sort of the public or industry face of jazz was kind of uh, getting into a more traditionalist kind of space yeah. for a while. You know what I mean? Right. And pushed all that kind of stuff underground. Um, and hopefully that sort of, you know, all the, all the other sort of forward look, you know, and it's fine. I mean, it's, you know, there's nothing wrong with wanting to play hard bop music. I play hard bop music. I love it. You know, I, it's great to situate yourself wherever your heart is and to know all those kinds of things. Um, and not everything has to be brand spanking new every time you play it. Right. Yeah. But uh, this idea of these sort of, you know, uh, more genre bending, uh, uh, adventurous young groups that have always been there. They're just getting a little bit more spotlight now, I think you know, as opposed to the more conservative button down style that we had through the 80s and into the 90s was the very public face of jazz. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Right. But just, you know, that was what was being pushed, you know. Um, I like your term button down. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, it's, it's a nicer way that I put it. It's more like, you know, a PBS <laughs> PBS fundraiser jazz is what I mean. Um, you know, that it, it appeals to sort of the, you know, I, I think that 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 um, the industry was scared that uh, all the traditional uh, jazz fans that they had were filtering away into all of these other kinds of, you know, genres that were splitting off and, and really made a move to try to grab some of the older folks back. You know what I mean? And uh, I, I guess it worked, you know? Yeah, I think it's, it's not shade on any of that stuff. I, I'm just saying it's, you know, it's kind of how yeah, it was. So I think it's but I'm a product of my exact. I feel like I'm a product of my exact moment in time. So what I do might even be considered old fashioned by today's standards, but that's, I'm situated where, where I came up with, you know? Yeah. But like you say, I mean, every, everything is okay. You know, it's like, yeah. whatever, yeah. I mean, if you want to do this today and then do right. this tomorrow. Yeah. It's only when you start talking about how, um, how the music should be played. Right. Cause when yeah. you say how it should be played, you're really talking about how it used to be played. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with with diving deep into that. You know what I mean? But it's becoming that's yeah. becoming more like a classical music, you know, repertoire kind of uh, idea, you know, or or a stylistic or period kind of idea. Yeah. And there's of course there's room for all that stuff. You know, that's why. Yeah. Think. What do you think, uh, Terry? What do you think about all that? I think jazz has always been a a fusion music mm -hmm. to to a certain extent, and that that. That's a positive aspect. It's, it's it's hard to define jazz, isn't it? But I suppose one of the things that is nearly all, nearly always there is improvisation. Yeah. Um, something else that's nearly always there is some sense about the value of groove. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's all sorts of different grooves, but right. they all they all have the they all have an importance in the music of being an infectious element. Get sometimes gets people dancing. Sometimes gets people's feet tapping. It just sometimes just generates a good feeling groove. Um, I suppose it's something that's not present. Those two things aren't present necessarily in all music throughout the world, and certainly classical music. I don't think, as much as I love classical music, it's a very valuable. I, I don't think it necessarily has a focus on the concept of groove or improvisation. So there's that distinction. Um, but I suppose those things. As long as they're there, we, we, we can say that they're jazz and they, they're up for being fused with other other genres, um, which sometimes have one or two of those elements in them. But, I, I th you know, it's, it always comes back to the fact that improvisation is one of the great aspects of the art form that we've we've nurtured and developed throughout its history. And I think it will always be there. Oh, yeah, it's, absolutely. <clears throat> yeah, I've I've noticed over the years in L.A., I mean, it's, let's see, you know, you have to think before the pandemic, right? <laughs> but um, yeah, for about, I'd say 10 years before the pandemic, or maybe longer, <clears throat> how these, we have, we had a, um, a club here that was wonderful. It was actually started by a student of mine um, called uh, the Blue Whale, and um, it was, mostly modern jazz and um it it was inter internationally used and known you know and it was really great and you saw things blending 
you know, especially uh, string players started mm -hmm. really being part of the groups, you know, and uh, so, uh, which was great. I mean, it, the string players loved it, right? You know, they were, they, I mean, people who wanted to venture off into in improvisation, mm -hmm. you know, they loved it. And, um, and I thought it was fascinating, actually. And, and now it just seems part of it. I actually, I mean, I really think that, um, you know, since artists reflect the society, you know, I think it's, it's cool that, uh, that the art now is blending so much more. Like you, you said, Peter, you said uh, world, the world something, world blending or world, you know, you included the word world in there. And I think that's yeah. what is being reflected now, you know, in yeah. especially jazz players, you know. I mean, it's still American music and specifically it's black American music at its at its origins, but it's become a worldly music is maybe another way to say it, you know, that yeah. it has always, um, you know, just drawn in because um, it's, it's right for that, you know, because um, there's just so many possibilities, you know, it just it, it happens to happen in time. You know, in a certain way, like Terry was saying, in terms of groove, right? That's yeah, that's yeah. very important. But you know, um, there's so much in common with other groups. You know, um, do you guys you know. know that group? And now I can't remember the full name. Bak Baka Bakavada. Let's see. They're Polish. They're Russian. Russian. They're Russian. It's a guy and three women, and. They're definitely Russian. The women wear these hats mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. this. Baka, Baka, Joyce, you know the name of it. Tell me who. Tell me who it is. Ba anyway, they're um, so the women. Let's see. There's one cello player, one keyboard player, and they all play mm -hmm. percussion and congas. And the guy plays mm -hmm. accordion, and they sing, and they have these very <clears throat> ethnic, um, you know sounding voices and melodies and so, and <clears throat> part of it is <clears throat> excuse me part of it is obviously written the songs and then uh, but then there's improvisation in it too and i god i went to a concert here mm -hmm. and two thousand people were there i mean they're very popular you yeah. know um and it's definitely That's a cool. mixed genre it's yeah. pretty cool yeah <clears throat> I think just jazz is particularly good at, at absorbing other dance elements um, and other improv improvisational elements, you know. Whoops, I'm sorry. Did you freeze or did, what did you say? Peter has frozen, which is strange because I haven't and I'm in the same I know, house. and you're just down the hall, but that's okay. He'll, he'll come back, I'm sure. <laughs> okay. How's it going, Peter? <laughs> well, maybe, maybe, it, maybe now uh, I can play something. Peter. Yeah, play something else. Um, uh, can you, he sent me some stuff from the record, but I'd like to see something live on YouTube. Can I just go to YouTube and see? It, we have our own YouTube channel for the band, yeah. Okay. So... Yeah, Nick. Uh, oh, it looks like he got off, but he'll come back. So um, let's see, YouTube. Uh, I'll just go to uh, Atlanticus. Is it just Atlanticus or something else? Atlanticus Jazz. There you okay. go. About five down. There okay. you go. So. Uh, what's I mean, there? can I just go to one of these? Well, that's a kind of one minute promo video. Oh, and so we I got booted out for some reason, but I'm back. You're oh. back. Well Your Wi-Fi decided I was talking too much. <laughs> um, I had shared a link in the chat of Terry's tune, Let's Walk, which is another one from the album. I would just like to do a video at this moment. Yeah, so. sure. Um, so we've got, I think the, there's Terry's arrangement of uh, Monin, which is very nice. Okay, let's do That's that. That's a good one. That's from the snowdrop, which you hey, know. The snowdrop, ladies and gentlemen. It's a bit out of sync, but there you go. <laughs> it's a very spotty one. Huh?
Yeah, I love it. That's really cool. <clears throat> Thanks. That's, isn't that a great arrangement? Very nice. I have to tell people that um, when Terry showed me that arrangement, that uh, he also showed me the recording that he did with Bobby Wellens um, of that arrangement. And um, most people on, uh, on our side of the ocean aren't very hip to Bobby Wellens, if at all. Um, and I wasn't at all. So there's a great late in life discovery of, uh, of somebody new that I've been able to really check Bobby out. Bobby Wellens or Mullins? Or? Bobby well Wellens, the uh, Scottish, Scottish, right? Uh, tenor yeah. player, played with uh, Stan Tracy on that, uh, uh, on a well, a number of things, and played with Terry Seabrook. Yeah, oh. brilliant, brilliant player. The uh. famous recording was under Milkwood, Stan Tracy. Quartet, That's the one, the Stan Tracy one, yeah. Bobby yeah. Wellens, which was a suite of pieces inspired mm -hmm. by the Dylan Thomas poem. Yeah. I'm writing it down. Yeah. Going on my li list to check out. So I try to spread the gospel, the gospel of Bobby, whenever I can. You know, I'm sure he'd be very, really... very pleased with your gospel. All <laughs> oh, right, well, good. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's uh, yeah. It's funny hearing how the arrangement is a little bit different from four years ago than we do today. I kind of just only is it little how tiny, how so in little tiny just... ways. Yeah, we usually go right from the sort of the 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 um, the 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 the, the traditional with well, original kind of changes in vibe of the trumpet solo we just go right back in but i noticed on that one that we put um it's a little insider baseball here but we that we use that little tag of yours terry after that as a way to transition yeah. back into latin playing it kind of works pretty nicely so i like the reharms terry it's really really cool especially in that latin yeah. section that a section mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Really nice very Great. very satisfying it's just a descending descending bass slide really yeah going down from E flat down to G flat. Mm -hmm. Really nice. I like it. Sounded really good. Thank you. Yeah. yeah it's a um, lot, tons of tons of fun to play too, especially with uh, to get to do the thing with Milo. That's terrific. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pretty good sounding recording actually for just uh, you know, phone style I mean, recording live. sitting right here. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm, I'm a little surprised. The video is a little jerky on, on my end here. but uh, Oh, yeah, I don't think, I mean, on my end, it was not jerky at all. Yeah, okay. Yes. Sometimes that does happen, though. Uh, um, yeah. The artist who I'm interviewing will say that it's a little jerky, mm -hmm. but I didn't see it. Um, mm. So what, you guys, uh, do you have a bucket list of uh, music stuff that you want to do? Um, I don't know. What do, uh, do you have anything, Terry? Do you mean uh, as a group or just in terms of where we're just for yourself? For rest, I mean, I, it might include line. might include the group, but it might be something else that you want to do, too. Well, I'll just jump in and say on my bucket list is to get this group back on our side of the Atlantic um, and and to, to, to do some uh, to do some dates over there. That would be just a modest short term bucket list. You know, um, yeah, that's, you know. I tend to like just get immersed in 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 the projects, you know. So um, what's happening? I, you mean I'm at the most? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'd love to keep, you know, and to and to push it out into the into the continent and just you know get 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 this thing going a little bit further, further afield. Definitely get get onto some more of the festival circuit if we can, mm -hmm. both in the UK and abroad. I mean, this uh, this tour that we're doing this this year, um, there were. An, quite a lot of venues which I contacted because I have, I have quite a good database for the venues. A lot of them were just honouring engagements that they've had to cancel for the last two years with COVID, mm -hmm. which is fair enough. Um, uh, a number of venues had ceased. So it's been, it's been quite a challenge, really, I think, for all of us in the music business, as we know. Um, but even now, things are picking up. Uh, there's, those, there's those two factors, really, which are, are still a challenge for us. Um, but, you know, we're just we're just putting it all back yeah. together slowly. Yeah. And of course, Looking new away. things are coming on stream. So mm -hmm. do, you, do you guys find uh, that? Well, I mean, I think Europe has a lot more venues than the U.S. However, maybe no. not. Maybe it's just because I'm not on that role in the U.S. Well, I, but I think it is because there's a lot more. Uh, it's like every little village has got some sort of like 
you know, what, what, what's over here called a jazz club, yeah. right? When we think of that in the States, we think of like a jazz venue, you know, yeah. like, uh, you know, uh, Yoshi's on your end, Blues Alley or the Village Vanguard is jazz clubs. But here, jazz club has more uh, the connotation of, you know, like uh, usually an organization that puts on performances and usually in a pub or some other kind of public space, but not always in the same space. And some of these that we've done in these little uh, little places have been running for like, what did you say the one in Cardiff was, it was going like 25 years Bexley is going for like 28 years and 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 uh, Hampstead has been going for like 27 or 20 it's been going for a long time you know yeah um and just putting on music in venues you know so they find a home to do it and if that home closes down or or doesn't do it anymore they they move over to the next one you know um yeah in uh, you know in one case they just move next door you know uh, the one in the Ro in Rochester. So, you know, it's a really cool concept. It's much more of a of a you know, um, uh, like an actual club. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. a club of people who are. But I mean, uh, it's, it's, we we have a mixed ecosystem. I think of yeah, venues. you do. You have what, what you've just mm -hmm. been talking about. They're, they're, it's very extensive. But there's also the club mm -hmm. network. I mean, like the Verdict and Ronnie Scotts, sure. where we played yep. a few weeks ago, and that was very exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and it festivals and I think, little things I think like the amount that, of activity just... does vary depending on where you are in the country Brighton has got an incredibly yeah. active and lively music scene because it's only a third of a million mm. people it's not it's not really that big but there's, there's a hell of a lot of musicians here yeah and there's a hell of a lot of gigs and consequently it does build an audience but you can go to some other parts in the UK and there's really nothing going on at all yeah yeah I, I so, and it's, it's sometimes hard to put your finger on it I'm sure it's in, I'm sure it's the same all over the world and I think one thing musicians always think the grass is greener somewhere else well, well I think we all, true. Yeah, yeah. We, all, we all have our struggles yeah <laughs> yeah I mean, you hear you hear of, you hear of top top musicians playing for 50 bucks or whatever in new york clubs. yeah 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 <laughs> actually when mm -hmm. i was in new york i went to the um the bird was it birdland or the blue note i think i went to birdland mm -hmm. and um I really didn't pay that much money to see, I mean, the cover was like $35 to see um, Mark Copeland and uh, Drew Grass and Joey Barron, Randy Brecker and Billy Drews, mm -hmm. $35, yeah. same, same here, you know, it's uh, so mm -hmm. how much, how much money could they be getting really from the club? Like you said, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm sure they, they've got more than $50, but still, you know, yeah, it's a game of slim margins, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I always feel like you know, if I'm if I'm not like I said, like in the U.S., if I'm not on the festival circuit, it's because I didn't get on. I didn't make it happen. Mm -hmm. You know, I, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. for me, before I met married my husband, my my husband, who's my second husband, it was about twenty one years ago or twenty two years ago, and I was really involved in go you know getting all the stuff together that would be a tour both in europe and here mm -hmm. and japan i was doing all of that and that was before you would send electronic press kisses pre press kits you'd send mm -hmm. it snail mail and you'd get all that paper together and a cd or a, or a cassette mm -hmm. tape or whatever and Eight by tens. Yeah. yeah and i was on that and i was working and i was combining with teaching and workshops and you know but then as time went on um i i guess my um priorities changed too you know growing mm -hmm. older being married uh whatever you know uh creating events and happenings in la that i had to well that my attention was on it's kind of like what you were saying before what you know like your um Peter, you said that, you know, you have different projects and whatever project mm -hmm. is kind of in your face, mm -hmm. you know, you're working on and and maybe this one that's kind of in there, too. And then maybe kind of an idea of something in the future. Yeah, and, yeah it's a it's an interesting life that we lead, you know. Right. Um, well, that's a choice uh, for some of us. It was a choice that I made as, you know, growing older, having family and all of that kind of stuff to focus on, you know, really like moving a lot more into the teaching realm of things so that most of the playing, I mean, I can't, you know, I can, but 
I'm not going to do like uh, Monday nights for $25 anymore. You know what I mean? And, and, yes. and things like that. You know, I just, I just can't. As much as I'd love to go out and play every night, physically I can't, you know, yes. until those kind of late nights. And it's not going to keep the lights on. So, you know, you try to strike a balance that certain parts of the year you're, you're focusing on one thing and other parts you're focusing on another. But it's always nice to have some or rather a couple of like projects that are sort of always brewing and you can really put your full musical attention to it rather than, you know, scuffling. You know, we did that when we were younger. Yeah. I don't know about you guys, but for me, too, well, set, being a singer, I really have to keep my chops every day mm. i have to pay attention every day and then even then i go in the studio or whatever and then i it takes me a little bit to get yeah. comfortable you know so i am doing live gigs here but um you know there's not all that many live gigs but it's important to keep doing the live gigs for me mm -hmm. you know um oh sure yeah 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 no that's keeping that's keeping like a, a good balance between between those kinds of things you know and, you know, what, what we've just been doing has been a, a, a great experience. Mm -hmm. 20, 20 gigs, you know, virtually back to back. Is it you like really start in to... two weeks or three weeks, right? Something like that. Oh, about That's four a, weeks. A month, four, yeah, kind of, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so we're off tonight, for example. <laughs> yeah. And um, where is, um, you get... sorry, Terry, is it, uh, it's not just in England, right? It's beyond? It is in England, yeah. Oh. But it's around, we've been up to Wales, so Wales is part another part of the united kingdom yeah mm -hmm. um yeah we haven't gone abroad yet but yeah. you know you get the opportunity to really get inside the music get to know one another and um yeah. really bed down you don't you know you don't often get those opportunities when you're doing lots of you might be doing as many gigs right. but it's a bit of right. this and a bit of that mm -hmm. you know to focus solidly on one thing really is a, a good experience yeah it's great isn't it it's just like, that's like the icing on the cake you know, yeah. uh, Benny Maupin lives here in L.A. and and over the years, uh, he was he was performing here. You know, rel I mean, not every week or something, but you would see him pretty often. You know, and um, what was interesting to me at the time was that he was doing the same songs, um, and I thought that was intriguing. And then I understood it was like, and that's kind of an old school point of view, I think, like basic what you just said, Terry, it's kind of like you get comfortable with something and then you can find out where you're growing. And mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, so you use the vehicle, but then, hello, it's today and mm -hmm. it's in this moment and it's with this drummer instead of the other, you know, or or yeah. not. But um, yeah, it's. Um, it's kind of a delicious extra perk, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree, you know, um, just being able to play these sets of songs, and we've been working in the new stuff during the tour, but just playing those songs, um, you know, I had to shake off a little of the of the dust and rust after four years, but they came back pretty quickly. And then to play them, like, yeah, literally, like, in, in all of these nearly back-to-back -back kind of situations, um, there's nothing like it, you know, you start to really find the kind of the spaces within within the music, you know, you get that kind of comfort with the music well, and with also, each other, you know. It, it enables the, the collective to really come together solidly. Yep. The band sound. And I think that's what's mm -hmm. been going on at gigs. It, it's been going down really well. And, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. I, I get a little bit nervous because they're playing quite a contemporary vibe. And we might go into a club where you think really what they, they're used to hearing is just it's just the standard. Yeah. Are they are they going to dig this? Yeah. And um, sometimes the promoter will tell you before you get there. All the, our audience likes standards. <laughs> mm -hmm. But you know, we got in and we've done our own thing. Um, yeah. And it's one. It's a couple of standards in the set, like moaning, but the rest yeah. of it's fairly original and it's fairly contemporary. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's great, great writing from Peter and the audience really relate to that. I think um, it might it might never have not heard most of it before, but they. They get off on the energy and the fact that it's a really strong collective sound. Yeah. I think that's what it's And about. they get off on the energy and the vibe is what I would say, you know. And also yeah. great writing by Terry Seabrook. Uh, I have to keep, I have to interject that. Um, <laughs> I think just, no, I really, I mean, it's like, I feel like we've got a good match, you know, yeah. and we've got a nice, uh, a nice book together, you know. 
of songs that really that we kind of really gel on right now and we're starting to gel on the new stuff too so it's you know we have a group sound you know that's the thing we got we, we got a little band going on here um yeah but i think the crowd relates to that you know uh, there's there's sometimes an assumption that oh they want to hear songs that they know right but if, as a jazz audience, you know, it might be something nice to hear softly as in a morning sunrise, even in, you know, or moaning, even in the arrangement that we do or something like that. But they want to hear the vibe of it and the energy of it. And I think they'll quickly kind of forget or not care that they don't know the song. They'll get into the vibe. You know, I think that that's the main thing. It's putting that energy and that that group energy. And they can tell that we're having fun, that we are comfortable with each other. We trust each other. And we're, we're just we're doing that. We're putting it out. And I think that's. Ultimately, that's that's the main thing, whether with, regardless of the age group, you know, um, I used to do a very, very adventurous trio jam session in Washington, and it was in a place that was just starting to come back. And the audience in there was like young punk rock kids or old retired kids or sort of well to do college kids all kind of mixing together. And you would think, well, you know, they're going to want to hear, you know, Bruce Springsteen, Frank Sinatra and uh you know and fugazi but no they wanted to hear jazz and they disliked the energy of it and all those people you know so together they they, they kind of made their own group energy by just you know being in the room with that you know um it was a pretty no holds barred jam session it wasn't you know playing songs you know they might have been standards a good amount of them, but they weren't played in the way people would be used to hearing them so i think that 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 really sold it for me that it's all about that kind of connection you know not external things like, you know, they're too old to hear contemporary stuff. Terry, we were playing in Croydon and one, some 75 year old guy came up to me and said, oh, someone's been listening to the Brecker brothers, <laughs> you know, and that's, <laughs> oh, I mean, and it's the right age, right? You know, yeah. you know, that would have been like a fully grown up person in the 1970s listening <laughs> to the contemporary music of the time. They're not supposed to just because they get older go back and now listen to 1940s music, right? They still know all that stuff. You know, their taste might, but they're, you know, and you hear like old guys talk to me about Weather Report. It's like, yeah, that was the music, you know what I mean? So, you know, I just think yeah. it's great, you know? That's how she, right? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, this subject, I think is super interesting, you know? And um, I mean, it touches a lot of different subjects mm -hmm you know, has little tendrils out into mm -hmm. a lot of areas. But um, yeah, it's just the um, the music that you want to play, the band that you're playing with, how mm -hmm. you're presenting it or how you're enjoying it and playing it. And mm -hmm. then, uh, like you say, the promoter, you mm -hmm. know, <clears throat> I, I traveled th through Japan for like 20 years with this pianist who was kind of like a Keith Jarrett type of player. And he mm -hmm. lived there and he was always striving to not do the old style. So mm -hmm. we would do standards, but totally, you know, mm -hmm. unique. And the promoter was constantly telling us to do standards. And he, I mean, he owned a music school. He knew that we were doing standards, but you know, he kept trying to push us into like real kind of conservative. Mm -hmm. It was never going to happen with this guy, with this piano oh. player, you know, and and fine. You know, I mean, we were we had a lot of fun doing it and the audiences loved it. They actually loved it because yeah. they could feel, as you say, the energy and the, uh, you know, that there was this this universe i call it the aesthetic universe but you know mm -hmm. this universe that was really strong and uh af effective you know yeah couldn't agree more yeah i think it's that's 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 where it's at doesn't mean that sometimes you won't be asked to play a certain right spot in history of music you know if that's what the gig calls for or if that's and also what, yeah, it doesn't mean that hired, you, you might know? fail on a right. song Right, yeah, right. <laughs> kind of yeah. fail, you know, like it's right. like, oh, well, that was kind of sure. boring. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, so I just, I, I guess, uh, you know, my, my, my thought is to not make uh, assumptions about your audience or not sort of like, you yeah. know, play down to them or think yeah. down to them, you know, you'd yeah. be surprised just because there's a room full of like older people. Why are you assuming that they want to hear their grandparents music or the way their grandparents heard that music? You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, it's a long time. It's 2022. Yeah. Plus, you know? the audience may just may not know what they like because yeah, they have sure. heard yeah. something new, you know. You know, but that's also, you know, I think what we are 
you know, what we can find too is that you can you can kind of read the room too, right? Yeah. You can see if you need to like move, you know, move things in a in a in a slightly different direction. Of course, you can always do that, but we haven't really had any any uh, uh, necessary necessity to do that. I don't think. Would you say, Terry? No, no. I mean, just come and present it. Our thing. The thing at one of the gigs was um, very much a sense that uh, they wanted standards, and um, mm -hmm. no, I think I think we did the right thing. We gave. Yeah. We might have added one extra standard in, but we played. We added sets. one extra standard exactly. That's what we did. You know. I mean, the flip side of it is you don't want to play over people's heads, do you? But I think I think sure. if you've got if you've got a really strong sound together, you're not doing that. You're inviting mm -hmm. people in. Yeah. A good, a good collective ensemble. People are going to be invited in, so you won't play over their heads. Yeah. You know, my husband is not really a jazz uh, lover. He mm -hmm. likes certain things about jazz. He likes, he likes groove, rhythm. Mm -hmm. um, and he actually, strangely enough, because I say strangely because he's not a jazz aficionado, but he likes modern drummers which is intriguing to me but um you know what the thing he he says that he doesn't love is you know how sometimes we'll fall into the same kind of form song to song to song like i'll sing then the piano player solo yep. then the bass player you know mm -hmm. the solo the constant solos that's what he he gets really bored with that he's like i don't i don't get it you know mm -hmm. jazz jazz gig protocol yeah yeah you know i'm sort of the, the standard operating procedure for like you know yeah yeah, yeah. horn solo horn solo guitar solo piano solo bass solo yeah. drums training fours were not and then you yeah. go back out yeah no i mean that, that that's certainly i the think thing, it's a, it? i think i think his feelings are perfectly valid reservation yeah. mm -hmm. really you know yeah. i feel i think I feel very self-conscious of that when i'm on the bandstand sometimes so we, we, mm -hmm. we're not really changing the format and we could do well, yeah. we have also songs that have, you know, sections that are are extractions from the form, you know. And, yeah. and, I didn't and, mean that bad, and, but I mean, when yeah, we yeah, did yeah. doing no, in general, general yeah. Jazz gig. yeah, but we do. Yeah, we do some AABAs. Why not? You know, I mean, it's it's all good. But yeah, that's true. Um, I mean, it's like um, talking to students, especially saying you kind of have to know sort of that protocol. So, you know, not to do it all the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. You have to know that, you know, um, that you need to, like, let the bass player go first, right? And you don't have to everybody, like, drop drop out, you know what I mean? You have to, like, try to, now that you know, kind of know how it's sort of typically done, right, that kind of gets you that idea of, you know, sort of going around the group, then you then you have something to sort of consciously sort of play around with, you know what I mean? Yeah. And the fact that not you don't, it's not only that you have, like, a quintet on stage, you've got a soloist, you've got a duo, you've got a trio, a quartet, yeah. and a quintet, you know what I mean? Yeah. You've got all of that stuff. So just to be able to use that stuff, even in that very, you know, if you're just blowing standards at a jam session or in a casual gig, to know that you can kind of, you know, drop out, you know, drums out, bass out, you know, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. And it makes it that makes it more interesting. And you're still just kind of looping the form. You're doing what you always do, but you're 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 introducing different kinds of landscapes and textures into that sort of traditional way of doing things. And just that alone you know, makes makes it more interesting, I think. I think know. also you don't have to have everybody soloing on every number. Yeah, no, of course. And, and it, it, it really, it comes from the desire of us all to improvise. Mm -hmm. that's, that's one of the things we love about this music, as I said earlier, we love to improvise. So we all want to, mm -hmm. we all want to say our bit on every song, but in a sense mm -hmm. that is making it rather predictable for the audience. And I think we, we should bear that in mind sometimes and when we're yeah. going out and playing on yeah. gigs. Yeah, it's pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting, uh, you know, I think also it goes hand in hand with being in the moment. And mm -hmm. when you're truly in the moment, not just on automatic, like, okay, now the bass player is going to solo now, you know, but when you're truly in the moment and you're serving the music, which we all do, um, or we all strive to do, uh, then you can actually think, oh, yeah, let's not do a piano solo on this one you know let's just mm -hmm. move along and and you're in the moment and it's it feels right you're observing it it's musical it's a musical choice mm -hmm. you know so um yeah so i think it goes hand in hand with that as well yeah yeah 
Hey, Terry, uh, well, I, ca I can ask both of you, but Terry, what what is your uh, biggest pet peeve in in arrange in arranging in arrangers? Like what when you hear somebody uh, somebody's arrangement, what is something you like wish would not happen? <laughs> like kind of like what we're talking about, like not everybody soloing, but uh... <laughs> Peter has a comment already. I guess I guess it's more like what I wish would happen, and that is, uh. well, you know, Horace Silver, for example. Yeah, he's a, fan, he's, a he's not just a great composer, so she's an, he arranges his own composition so beautifully. You know, yeah. there's introductions and codas, there's interludes, mm -hmm. there's even arranged piano comping. Really, um, mm -hmm. he thinks about a, a composing in, in a lot of the aspects of the music many of us don't. So I, I guess I wish we we followed his example more. If you like, <laughs> I agree okay. with that. No. I agree with that. You're just I like, like having built-in compositional elements to the yes. tune, not just a lead sheet. You know what I mean? Um, I'll just I'll just jump onto that and and just talk again from a teaching perspective really quickly. You know, when everybody plays, um, let's say, so what, right? Yeah. You know, whether they do the intro or not, it's great if if you play piano based on the intro. But when you come in and you play that song. What happens if you call on a jam session? The bass goes, -doo -ba -doo -ba -doo -ba -doo, and every horn on stage goes, wah, wah, uh, yeah. right? And if you listen to the record, the horns lay out the whole first time, right? Uh, and then they come in the second A and they leave off the last response before they go to the bridge, right? And they do that every time. And just those little tiny, tiny details make it so much more interesting, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So those are like little arrangement details that are in there. You know, and also the bass line um, stays constant through the bridge, whether that was a mistake that Paul Chambers made or whether it was, you know, he doesn't go ba 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 he just he just plays the line straight through the bridge, right? So there's maybe that was intentional, but that's what was immortalized, right? So when you know those little details, you know, it doesn't mean like you have to do a kitchen sink type arrangement, which is going to be my comment, right? Yeah, you yeah. You can do little details, right? The, the little vamp in between the heads and all blues. Yeah, it gives breathing room, right? If everybody just goes like from the from the head and right back to the top again, it doesn't have any of that breathing that that the original one does. And that's intentional, right? That's like, and that's the that's the arrangement. You know, that's the arrangement, right? It's a 12 bar blues or 24, depending on how you're dividing it and counting it, right? It's a it's a basic blues form with a little interlude in there, which is just the intro vamp. And that makes it so much more relatable and it prevents you from getting fatigue listening to it. I was going to say, because we were talking about Jacob Collier in the car the other day and sort of what, how we think about that. And we were all in agreement that it's astounding and amazing and super hip. And there's like just so much to absorb. And that the one complaint that I have sometimes is that all of those uh, arrangements feel like kitchen stink arrangements, like everything is in there. You know what I mean? There's so much stuff in there that it's almost, it can get kind of like, it, yeah. can get, it can get fatiguing to try to listen to all of those transitions, you know. Um, that's no shade on, on Jacob Collier and what he does. I think it's amazing. But you know what yeah. I mean? It's like, yeah. wow, that was like a lot to process. And, and yeah. I hear that in like a lot of big band arrangements, you know, that are these kind of supercharged, made for like college big band competition type arrangements that are yeah. just like, yeah. there's so much stuff stuffed in there that, you know, none of it really gets any any good then none of it gets its due. They might all be good ideas, but they just kind of get bumped around like, you know, like like balls on a pool table, you know? Well, that it's was my too, complaint about arranging. It's too too much. I mean, I always tell my students too much of anything is boring. Mm -hmm. There's, you can't you can't do everything, 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 mm -hmm. everything. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, you you need space. You need, you know, space to look at something and maybe mm -hmm. change it again, being in the moment, mm -hmm. you know, Um yeah, and I, I saw two groups last week that w were interesting. I love all the musicians in both groups, but one group, John DeVersa, his small group, and he's mm. he's brilliant, and he's a brilliant writer, brilliant arranger, but the coolest thing is he and his musicians play like this. Um, like, they hardly ever play on one, mm -hmm. but it's it's in the writing and the musicians mm -hmm. know they can play like that mm -hmm. so they're they're kind of more free and when they do play on the one it's orgasmic mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like oh my god you know mm -hmm. and um 
And then I saw the other group who the musicians I love too, but there was really like no breath, no space. Like the bass player mm -hmm. was always playing and mm -hmm. you know, I was just interest. It's just interesting to see for myself, which, which one was more pulling for me, you know? Yeah. Could depend on the time of day too, I think, you know, well, but yeah, that's it's, true it's like, <laughs> but it's, it's true though, you know, it's true. Um, hmm. You know, people forget also that simple things like repetition is tension. That's building tension. Yes. Music, you know what I mean? And then that when it changes, that's release. the release, you know, <laughs> and it's like very simple devices like that, you know, no matter how um, uh, hip you know how to play the notes, right. But yeah. using those kinds of things is, is, you know, it's arranging in like improvising as well. Almost and uh, another thing that's, that's often absent and we all say this, don't we? It's dynamics. Yes. We don't. Most of us are guilty of it. We don't. We don't see mm -hmm. the the advantage of getting dynamics into the music more. Mm -hmm. I don't know why that is. Um, got any ideas on why that is? I don't know, but that group, John Diversa, they mm -hmm. had dynamics too, and they were all, they could play balls to the wall, but they yeah. they also they in every song they had dynamics. It was like down, and the drummer was like like soft and then you know mm -hmm. built up and yeah i don't i i i don't know it's like you said cookie cutter it's kind of like mm -hmm. well this is a balls to the wall song so we're we're just going to do that the whole song you know instead of being again in the moment creating mm -hmm. something really wow. out of the moment you know and not just yeah. on a, on an automatic assumption you know well i mean think about i mean it just to go into a different place with it think about like all the grunge bands you know that came out in the early 90s and what became kind of their cliche were these sort of like soft verses and then these explosive choruses and so you had like two dynamics in it but that was kind of unheard of in sort of like you know music that you would hear on the popular radio that kind of like huge dynamic range right yeah and it kind of became a cliche of that movement but it was really effective you know you know, because you'd sort of lean in and then you'd kind of get blown away and then you'd lean in and get blown away, you know, and that's, you know, that was a really, really effective device that that hadn't really been used that much in like rock or popular music. You know what I mean? So you know, I think one time you know, you can learn I, saw from that too. I saw that Ornette Coleman group, you know, that, mm -hmm. uh, well, it was around the time when Pat Metheny and he had the yeah, project. prime time. Yeah, but Pat wasn't with the band, but it was like two guitar yeah. players, two bass players, two drummers. Mm -hmm. And it was in a big venue in LA and I could not get far enough away because the vo the dynamic level was here the whole entire time. Mm -hmm. I I didn't quit I didn't get it. I couldn't take it. I mean there were a lot of people there who loved what was going on. Yeah. And I I mean I can I like the I like loud music too, you know, mm -hmm. but I I it was just too much. It didn't give my brain uh, time like mm -hmm. space to go oh you know so i don't know <clears throat> yeah that makes it can make a big difference yeah well you guys it's it's almost over two hours went by real fast and um <clears throat> do you want to do you want to say anything i mean do you want to tell us anything what to look out for we're obviously looking out for your upcoming new record well this record is new right now right it's new yeah, yeah. it's brand new came out uh, early june and that's what we're very excited to kind of share right Still now getting some reviews yep reviews are coming in and uh you know getting it out on the all the usual platforms and uh looking to to um to tour again next year hopefully you know that's um that's the plan. That's what's in the cooker. So, um, yeah. What about you, Terry? Yeah, I'm looking forward to, to that for sure. Yeah. And uh, we'll probably have the uh, tour next year promoting the next record, so it probably won't be out for a little while yet, will it? I mean, yeah. until you go on tour these days, you're not going to sell that many because you've got to have something to launch yeah. in. And mm -hmm. let's face it, most of the physical sales are now on gigs. Yeah. We rely on the internet for other other avenues of sales. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, <coughs> thanks for for being on. <coughs> I 
I know two hours is kind of a bit a chunk out of your day, so thank you. Oh, no, it's fine. It's, it's, it's a nice you, way Kathy. to wind our evening down. Yeah, thank you so much for having us on. This it's is really going to go out. Yeah. Going to go out to a pub now and have have a beer. Uh, well, well it's ten o'clock. Yeah. We might do. <laughs> yeah, Terry, go on. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll talk yeah, about it. You were going to go to your jam session. <laughs> I'm not going to make it down there. No, I don't have that. I don't have that kind of uh, hustle in me right now to race out and catch the last half hour across <laughs> town. I'm going to just, I'm going to chill out. I've been, I've been going full, full steam ahead here. But uh, yeah, we can go out and have a little, uh, a little beer in the pub if they're, if they're open. So. We'll, well we have that. we have some nice comments here too so yeah uh, people enjoyed it, it. yeah um, where so, are the comments where are the comments well you I... you won't see them unless you go to facebook live right now facebook but um yeah. yep and okay well um, thanks everyone for tuning yeah. in thanks for who tuned in i wish we could and see if you people here. if people want to uh get our music they can go to bank camp and order a physical copy yeah. Or download, download the digital copy. Yeah, yeah. Bandcamp is cool. Bandcamp is great. You, yeah, you could even order a, a T-shirt if you want. Oh. We'll have those up there. Yeah, we made special T-shirts. So. Oh, that's cool to know. Hand screened by me, actually. Yeah. Is it in black and white like your shirt, or is is it with a color? No, no, it's not. It's not this one, but it's kind. It's the West Pier with our name and our thing on it. So we'll make them to order. <laughs> we'll keep an eye out for that. We just keep coming up with merch angles. No, but the, no, but uh, buy the CD or or the or the download and stream. Uh, you know, if you go to Bandcamp, if if you're not familiar with Bandcamp, uh, everybody out there in Facebook Live Land. Uh, yeah. It's the best way to sort of most most directly support the artists. Yes, it is. It really is, you know, um, and uh, especially when we get around to Bandcamp Fridays again in September, where the first Friday of the month, 100% of what you pay, and you can you can pay the $7 or £7, uh, or you can pay what you wish, you know, you can pay more if you like. So if you want to directly support uh, not just us, but please us, but anybody else, you're, you're really, really supporting them directly by going through Bandcamp. Yeah, uh, I agree. Bandcamp is that, good. or you can you can stream uh, our songs uh, forty thousand times on on Spotify. Make a dollar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they didn't hear that. No. Yeah. So um, also also um, our, our website atlanticusjazz.com, and we've got oh, two yeah. more gigs on our tour. For those of mm -hmm. you that are in our area of the south of England, mm -hmm. we're playing tomorrow night at the. Three, three horseshoes, is it? Three horseshoes in, in, in uh, Knockhole. Just go to the Kent. website to find out where it is. Yeah. It's Atlanticus Jazz. And the, and uh, the last gig is in Arundel, in Arundel on Thursday, which is in Sussex. Mm -hmm. If you look on the usual social media mm -hmm. channels and uh, on the web for Atlanticus Jazz, one word you will, will pop up. That's who we are. We're very easy to find. Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, uh, Twitter even, you know. Um, so <clears> that's that's us. Okay, great. Pop in and say hi. Yeah, and I'm just going to say one thing. Uh, uh, tomorrow is a singer who actually founded uh, an old vocal group uh, from the 70s called Rare Silk. I don't know if you guys Ooh. remember that group. Mm -hmm. So uh, her name is Marilyn Gillespie, and so mm -hmm. she's going to be on live tomorrow. And then the next day, kind of a, I, it's kind of an up and coming, but he's, He's not in his he's not in his twenties, but he's a really great singer in L.A. Called, named Sidney Jacobs, mm. and he's um, he joined uh, the Fifth Dimension a few years ago, oh. and um, he's been working on his own project, which is kind of modern and uh, composing and arranging, and so he's going to be on Wednesday, and then <clears throat> I'm going to have archives with Deborah Pearl, Diane Shore. Uh, as an archive, Kendra Shank and Victor Orlando. So, you know, anybody interested in knowing who's coming up can go on my website and see that. And uh, I will say for those of you in LA that this coming Sunday, I will be performing with a really beautiful trio at the Urban Press Winery in Glendale. And um, so on that note, that's it. That's all the news that's fit to print. Thank you guys. Thank you so much, Kathy. Hope Thank I you, get Kathy. to work with you someday and yeah, talk too. to you in between. Yeah. Too. Nice to see you, Terry. Hope to see you in the UK again or maybe in California. Okay. All right, you guys. Bye. -bye. Bye.